On this week's show, Tesla updates its software, BMW talks to your home, and GM decides not to support the rollout of CCS Quick Charging. These stories and more coming up next on 10. Enjoying today's show on YouTube and want to read the stories we're referring to today? Just head to our website at transportevolve.com forward slash TEN, where you'll find today's show notes as well as links to the latest future car news, buying guides, tech primers, and car reviews. It's Friday, January 15th, 2016. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and after a three week break, we're back in the saddle for a new year with lots of news to cover. So we'd best get on. And to start today's show, we're going to CES in Las Vegas, where there was a whole bunch of new news concerning cleaner, greener, safer, and smarter transportation. First up, the unveiling of the Faraday Future FF01, a car which was leaked on the Apple App Store Boo Boo just hours before its official launch event. So by the time I and the rest of the motoring press officially arrived at the reception, there wasn't much for us to see. Indeed, having endured the terrible blue lighting in the makeshift marquee and listening to how Faraday Future were supposedly unlike any other automaker out there, we were given a short video presentation on the company's flexible modular chassis and drivetrain and told how it in turn would make it possible for the company to churn out all sorts of cars in double quick time. The problem, we didn't see a single car or even a mock-up of the chassis. What we did see instead was the FF01, a car kept up high on stage and watched closely to make sure nobody got too close to it after the big reveal. Essentially a concept car detailing what the company thinks it could one day make, the FF01 was outlandish, impossible and tough to imagine on the real road. And while we're loath to say it, until FF has a car or a platform it can let us play with or at least see in the metal, we're incredibly sceptical that it will revolutionise the world as it claims. Talking of revolutionising the world, that's exactly what German automaker Volkswagen seemed to be aspiring to the very next day, or at least revolutionise the way in which the world feels about a firm mired in controversy over Dieselgate. At a CES keynote presentation, Dr. Herbert Diess, CEO of Volkswagen Passenger Cars, profusely apologised not once but three times for the Dieselgate scandal and revealed an upgrade to the Volkswagen e-Golf called the e-Golf Touch offering a brand new infotainment system with gesture-based control and voice control, as well as an always-on internet connection, the eGolf Touch will enter production later this year, and it will have a larger battery pack which rumours say will offer around 108 miles of range per charge. Also unveiled was the Volkswagen Bud E concept, the latest in a long line of microbus-based electric concept cars from the German automaker. But what made us take notice this time was the all-new chassis on which the Bud E is based, offering a claimed 233 miles of range and all-wheel drive. It could be the thing to save Volkswagen from oblivion in the automotive world. The challenge, bringing it to market, which as we noted earlier this week, is a tough thing when you're as strapped for cash as Volkswagen is right now. An automaker less strapped for cash, however, is Toyota, which announced at CES a host of brand new hires at its brand new $1 billion Toyota Research Institute, split between two campuses, one on the east coast with an easy reach of MIT and one with an easy reach of Stanford on the west coast. Toyota says the TRI will help it develop autonomous drive technology that will give 100% automated driving in situations where conventional autonomous drive systems hand control back to the driver. There's no time to go into the list of hires here, but Toyota says the TRI will also let it investigate new materials, using computer algorithms to develop and test brand new materials that us lowly humans haven't even thought of yet. Think of it as the place where the brainy computers go to after graduation. Or something. Uh, but talking of brainy computer stuff, while we are at CES, we happened upon the massive, and I do mean massive, Samsung exhibit, which included lots of gadgets and fun things for the world of the future. And um, hidden in a corner was an exhibit announcing a partnership between Samsung SmartThings and BMW, demonstrating how you can now control your SmartThings enabled home from your connective drive enabled BMW i3 electric car. We were given a little demonstration and it seems to be impressive stuff. 
If you're the kind of person who is always forgetting to turn off the lights in the morning when you leave the home, for example, this new tie-up will make it possible for you to activate SmartThings macros from within your car, making your home smarter and we'd hope your life a little less hectic as a consequence. While SmartThings integration is already available for i3 owners, there's an update due from BMW in the next few weeks that will automate things the other way, allowing you to integrate your electric car into your smart home of the future, setting climate control, checking on charge, and a whole host of other things too. Integration wasn't far from General Motors' minds at CES either, with the official unveiling of the tech-filled 2017 Chevrolet Bolt EV electric car. While we didn't make it to the official unveiling ourselves due to some weather-related flight problems, we can tell you that the production Chevrolet Bolt EV is a good-looking car, packing a 60 kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery pack for more than 200 miles of estimated range, seating for five adults, a target price of $30,000 after incentives, and an on board 7.7 kilowatt charger as standard. What isn't standard, however, is CCS Quick Charging, which GM says will be available as an optional extra and we presume a standard item on higher end cars. We're a little disappointed though that including Quick Charging as standard is not included and even more frustrated to know that it has no intention to invest in CCS Quick Charging infrastructure as Nissan, Tesla, BMW and Volkswagen have with their respective Chadamo, Supercharger and CCS quick charge networks. As we explained on Wednesday this week, that makes things pretty uncomfortable for GM and it makes the Bolt EV a pretty pointless car if you happen to live in large swathes of the US without CCS quick charging provision. I'm not the person to say that GMM has got this one wrong, but I hope that this company changes its mind before the Bolt EV launches this coming October. From one dumb decision to another now, with the news that Mitsubishi has decided to forego Chadamo DC quick charging on the US market version of the highly popular Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid when it launches there later this year. The Outlander PHEV, which has been on sale now in Europe and Asia for more than two years, has become a rip-roaring success among buyers there, partly due to it being the only plug-in hybrid on the market today with quick charging capabilities. But as we explained this week, Mitsubishi has chosen to remove the feature for the US market model, as it did with the Australian and New Zealander Outlander plugins, because it believes there aren't enough Chadamo DC quick chargers to make it worthwhile. While we can understand the logic, we'd like to point out that right now there are about 1,500 Chadamo points in North America, and the markets where the Outlander PHEV is most likely to be popular, namely the coastal areas and towns like Austin, Minneapolis and Atlanta, have plenty of charging stations to share around. It might be my European perspective, but I for one think Mitsubishi is making a massive mistake here. While we're on the subject of mistakes, we're guessing someone at Toyota is feeling just a little bit sheepish right now after the news that the Japanese automaker has quietly asked the eight dealerships in California where the limited production Toyota Mirai hydrogen fuel cell electric car is sold to hold off on any more deliveries until there are places to fill up. As we explained on Thursday, Toyota had initially hoped that there would be about 50 hydrogen filling stations in operation in the state of California by the time it launched its first production hydrogen fuel cell car in October last year. But with less than 12 in operation right now, Toyota and its customers are finding it much harder than they had initially hoped to find a place to fill up. The result? Despite taking temporary filling trailers to six of the eight dealerships where the Mariah is sold, Toyota has asked dealers to refrain from making any more deliveries of the car until there are more commissioned hydrogen filling stations in operation in the public. For a company that had hoped to change our opinion of hydrogen fuel cell technology forever, that's got to be a pretty tough thing to deal with. And if we're honest, we're actually feeling just a little sorry for Toyota right now because it's worked so hard to tell us how amazing the hydrogen future would be. And right now, it's not living up to that expectation. What is living up to expectation right now, however, is Tesla Motors, which surprised us all last weekend by rolling out the System 7.1 software update for Tesla electric cars. As Tesla CEO Elon Musk explained in an official press call late Sunday morning, the new update adds some important tweaks to the Tesla Model S autopilot software, improving performance of autonomous driving system on single lane roads, on corners and on residential streets, slowing down for corners and restricting maximum speed on surface streets to keep everyone safe. The update also includes a summon mode, a feature that can be operated only on private land, but does make it possible for the 
first time for your Tesla Model S to park itself automatically for the first time without you in the car. It will also come out of its parking space and meet you in the morning at your door, shutting garages and all sorts of things, provided you unplugged it, of course, and you have a private drive. But sticking with autonomous drive technology, we had exciting news on Thursday this week when US Secretary of Transportation Anthony Fox unveiled nearly $4 billion in commitment from the US government into autonomous vehicle and connected vehicle deployment. Following on from President Obama's final State of the Union address last Tuesday, Secretary Fox's announcement detailed a whole host of measures designed to help accelerate the deployment and development of self-driving cars. These include setting up a series of autonomous drive corridors across the US, setting out a set of federal guidelines for states to follow when it comes to autonomous car legislation and regulation, and working with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to figure out just what types of tests autonomous vehicles will need to pass before being allowed on the public highway. The measures should get underway as quickly as possible, with the Department of Transport setting itself some fairly big milestones for the next six months. But while the initial phase of the project will be over long before President Obama leaves the White House, the original overall commitment from the federal government will continue for a total of 10 years, by which time, with any luck, our cars will be doing the driving for us. And that's a vision shared by the Renault-Nissan Alliance and its CEO, Carlos Ghosn, who told us last week at a special event in Silicon Valley that Renault-Nissan was planning to bring 10 different cars to market in the next four years with some degree of autonomous drive technology as standard. The event, held at the end of last week, and the reason we didn't have a show, also gave us first-hand experience of Nissan's latest self-driving Leaf electric cars. While I don't have any of my personal video from the drive to show you, I can tell you that the experience was pretty impressive. And if you're interested in finding out more, you can read my lengthy write-up at the end of this show over at www.transportevolve.com. Talking of which, I think I've got today's show pretty wrapped up, so it is in fact time for me to bid you farewell for the week and get on with the hard task of editing this video up. As always, you'll find all the news that's fit to print at our website at transportevolve.com. Catch up with us on Twitter at Transport Evolve, or check out our latest shows on our usual YouTube channel. And if you liked what you saw today, please consider keeping us independent and impartial by visiting our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Transport Evolve and pledging your support from as little as $1 per month. You know, this is my only source of income and we'd like to employ other people. So if Patreon doesn't shift up a gear, then I'm going to have to do this alongside other stuff. And that means less content for you to enjoy. So please go on, help us out. As always, there's a lot we haven't managed to fit into today's show, including how CARB and the EPA have rejected Volkswagen's Dieselgate solution for non-compliant cars, Fiat Chrysler plugs the minivan into the 2017 Chrysler Pacifica PHEV, we explain why Tesla had such big queues just after Christmas at the Tejon Ranch Supercharger, and our very own Kate Walton Elliott ponders just what green cars you can buy on a super tight budget. So when we're done, be sure to head to our sites to read them all. Thanks for watching. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. Have a great weekend and until next time, keep evolving.